Hi everyone, it's me Ben and welcome to Entertainment Zone. Um, now, as I teased you a while ago, um, I would be doing another top 10 films of the year um, and said it would be coming January 2012. Um, so we're at the very, very end of January um, now. It's the 30th today as I'm recording this. Uh, so a little later than I'd hoped. Uh, but it's here nonetheless yes i'm here for my top 10 films of 2011 now in my top 10 films of 2010 um inception topped the list um so uh, which film will be following in its footsteps um well stay tuned to, to find out uh, i want to point out that this list is based on uh, the movies that I saw um, in 2011, it's personal to me. Um, there are some films I, I never managed to catch and I'm going to catch, you know, either on Blu-ray or 3D Blu-ray or whatever, um, such as, you know, Transformers 3, never got to see that. So if you're expecting this on the list, it's not going to happen. So it's my top 10 films of 2011 based on my personal viewing experiences. Um, so enough of the chit chat, let's cut down to business and kick off this list of the top 10 films of 2011. And in at 10, it's a kids film uh, that for me, um, I really, really enjoyed. Um, I took my little sister to see it, um, she's seven, um, and we both really, really enjoyed this movie. Um, it is Hop. Um, now I was torn between uh, whether to put Hop or Paul on the list, um, Paul, a good sci-fi comedy, uh, which I really enjoyed. Um, but you know, um, I, I love that movie and it was hard to choose between the two, but I felt that Hop had to go on this list because it was a really, really good kids movie and it wasn't an animation, it had CGI animation in it obviously, but you know, it was a live action movie um, and a kids film and really enjoyable, you know, it had, uh, you know, voices of like Russell Brand and Hugh Laurie and uh, starring people like James Marsden. But both me, uh, you know, as a grown up and, you know, my, my sister, we both found it really, really entertaining hop. And, you know, there aren't many Easter movies, but that was a, uh, it was a good um, story of Easter. And uh, the Easter Bunny and what he goes through. And it was just an all round good family film. And uh, a surprise uh, hit, um, you know, uh, I saw Hop, Rio and Rango last year and for me Hop was really the kids film of 2011. Uh, so um, Hop's in at 10, let's carry on without further ado. At number 9, Jack Sparrow's back in Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides. So the Pirates trilogy had finished uh, on a bit of a sour note for a lot of people. Uh, personally, my favourite instalment of the series is Dead Man's Chest, the second instalment. Um, and for a lot of people, at World's End was a disappointment. Um, so um, what did they do? Well, they got a new director on board. Uh, they got rid of um, Kira Knightley and Orlando Bloom and brought in um, Penelope Cruz and Ian McShane. And uh, what, f you know, amazing casting uh, uh, choices they were, you know. Uh, Penelope um, as Angelica was really, really good. And it was good to have a strong female character, um, you know, uh, compared to h how I felt uh, Keira Knightley portrayed Elizabeth as, you know, I know she had the scenes like Captain Elizabeth in the third movie, but Elizabeth to me was very plain damsel in distress kind of girl where Angelica is feisty and you're never quite sure whether you can trust her and she's very much Jack's equal in the movie and Ian McShane um, as the bad guy Blackbeard was excellent sublime casting there real great choice um, and you know having Jeffrey Rush back as Barbosa was excellent and you know him teaming up with Jack was just amazing so it was a real good movie um, and uh, it was the Pirates first venture into 3D and it didn't look bad in 3D not you know the you know I think you know, all the stuff in the jungles uh, uh, in the daytime in the bright colours the 3D looks amazing and you know there are a couple of out of the screen moments but all the bright coloured stuff 
in uh, Pirates of the Caribbean on Strange Tides look great in 3D but you know there are quite a few dark scenes uh, which you know 3D doesn't really lend itself to but on the whole wasn't bad um, you know I have the movie on 3D Blu-ray and I must say that it looked better on the 3D TV than it did at the cinema so um, I was very happy uh, about that but yeah I really enjoyed um, On Stranger Tides uh, it felt like a breath of fresh air to the franchise it was going back um, to uh, the roots of the original movie you know it was its own standalone story it continued loosely from you know the end of the trilogy with Jack going to find the Fountain of Youth but it was a self-contained story uh, they left um, a window of opportunity there if they want to continue um, but it could also have been a nice ending to the series um, uh, and a real great job so um, I'm very happy that Pirates of the Caribbean is back and it definitely deserved uh, to be on the list um, but let's move on at number eight it was a uh, return to another franchise for its fourth entry but it's been a while since the last entry of this franchise it is of course Scream uh, with Scream 4 um, a good year for horror 2011 and I can tell you there's going to be some more horrors coming up uh, on this list but uh, Scream 4 uh, I know it, uh, for quite a few people it kind of uh, divided uh, the fans um, but I personally liked it a lot I saw it in cinemas twice actually I have to really like a movie to do that um, but I really thoroughly enjoyed um, Scream 4 it was just good to have the trio back you know um, Sid, Gail and Dewey um, all great in their roles you know and um, we had some great new casting you know Emma Roberts as Jill really good casting but uh, most importantly Hayden Panettiere um, of Heroes of Fame uh, she joined the cast as Kirby and she was excellent you know and I thought the story was very very good Um kind of wish it was longer <laughs> Scream for because I just didn't want it to end uh, and you know the reveal of the killers and the ending scenes uh, were real good stuff uh, and plus we had um, cameos from Anna Paquin and my favourite actress Kristen Belt so that's always a bonus and you know um, I think it was a um, proof that Wes Craven still got it you know uh, as a director he did a real good job bringing Ghostface back uh, to the big screen and it was just a fun enjoyable movie it had a lot of nostalgic elements um, which was great and a lot of similarities to the original screen um, but uh, it was a real enjoyable movie and I'm glad it was back I hope there's going to be a Scream 5 I can't wait um, so thank you for coming back to Scream um, let's move on though uh, to number 7 well at 6 and 7 I have to admit um, it was hard to separate these two movies because they're both Marvel movies um, and it was a real toss up between well which did I enjoy more you know um, and so the movies I'm referencing are of course Captain America and Thor um, and at number seven it was Captain America it was so hard for me to um, separate these two because I enjoyed both movies a lot um, but when I think of which I enjoyed more I think of Thor but Captain America which is our number seven movie um, it was a real um, good adaptation of Cap and I'm glad that they chose the um, the World War Two setting you know obviously we had some stuff in the present day at the beginning and end of the movie um, but I'm glad that we really went into Cap's route, uh, Cap's route you know um, his background um, uh, I couldn't get my words out there um, so yeah it was good to get into his roots uh, and I'm glad they stuck with that element it was good to see the classic costume uh, that was funny and the development of the costume and um, it had a phenomenal cast and um, I have to admit I wasn't sure about Chris Evans when I heard him announce I thought well he's already the human torch and he always kind of plays the you know the Jack the Lad kind of roles but he actually um, was spot on as Steve Rogers uh, he was a real real good cap and great choice um, and against Hugo Weaving's Red Skull it was excellent you know these two um, they're just real great casting and you know people like Tommy Lee Jones in the movie too it was real, really really good I didn't like the um, 
you know, Bucky's big moment, I don't want to give too much away, was changed uh, from a helicopter to a train sequence. But it was still cool as a movie, but I didn't like that that specific moment was changed. Um, but it was a good movie, and and it felt like a, it did you know it was like a war movie, but still a superhero movie, um, and you know I really liked that, um, and it definitely set up the Avengers at the end. You know it was the last of the solo movies before the Avengers comes out, and the ending was brilliant, and the post credit scene amazing. Uh, it was also released in three D, but you know Marvel kind of skimps on its three D. Uh, so not much to say on uh, on the 3D aspect. And then um, at six, as we've said, is Thor. Um, you know, soon as I heard Kenneth Branagh had got the job as director of Thor, I just thought, you know what, this movie's in safe hands. It's going to be a real great movie. And by George, it was. It was a real, real, real good movie. Um, Asgard looked phenomenal. Uh, the casting was phenomenal. Chris Hemsworth as uh, Thor, Tom Hilston as Loki, um, Natalie Portman as Jane. You know, the casting was spot on. Uh, and, you know, we had the Hawkeye cameo from Jeremy Renner. That was great. And it was a real good story, too. And I'm glad that, you know, I was really worried, like, hmm, how are they going to get the balance between Asgard and Earth, right? And, you know, the mystical... Um, the reality um, but it was all done really really well you know we had the frost giants in Asgard and then we had the destroyer here on earth um, it was a well-rounded superhero movie and you know I hope that Thor did for people what Iron Man did for people a couple of years back and really boost, really boost Thor's name uh, I was certainly impressed visually it was amazing too uh, Kenneth Banner's got a real eye for detail uh, and it was great and Anthony Hopkins was great as I've always said I always thought Brian Blessed should be Odin but uh, I have to admit Anthony Hopkins did a great job again the 3D kind of skimped on by Marvel um, you know, I really wish they'd shoot their movies in 3D. They announce them in 3D and then just convert them all. Lazy Marvel, lazy. Uh, and sadly, I think the same's happening for Avengers. Ooh, never mind. Um, but both Thor and Cap were great Marvel movies. And obviously setting up, you know, the Avengers that's out this year. Um, some people have said, you know, that they felt that these movies, Thor, Cap, Iron Man, feel like setups to the Avengers uh, the only film I can think of that felt like that to me was Iron Man 2. I think Thor and Cap, you know, they're good origin stories um, for these heroes and have a good self-contained story. But at the same time, for fans of the Avengers, it's definitely setting up. Um, so, great work by Marvel uh, last year in 2011. So, without further ado, um, let's move on to our top five now. And in at five... Um, it's the end of a franchise. Um, lots of franchises, aren't there, um, in this list? Um, it was the end of an era. It really, really was. Yes, I'm talking about Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2. Um, I was unsure uh, when they announced that the Harry Potter uh, and the Deathly Hallows was going to be split into two movies. I was unsure. Having now seen both, yes, I can understand why they did it. I felt that the second part, you know, part two, which is the movie we're discussing, was a more enjoyable movie. H had a lot more going on, a lot more action, um, but a lot more personal moments, uh, especially the scenes with Snape. Oh my God, Alan Rickman's been robbed. He should be nominated for a supporting actor. Seriously, he was phenomenal in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows part two. Yeah, Alan Rickman, really, really great. Um, and Ralph Fiennes was great as Voldemort too, real good stuff. And you know the trio, um, Dan, Rupert and Emma, they've really, really grown as actors and give some of the best performances here. Um, but going back to the splitting of the books, I think there's more going in on part two. You know, it was a lot faster paced than part one. But, you know, they didn't cut too much out from Deathly Hallows. And so they were very faithful adaptations. And I think without the split, this perhaps wouldn't have been possible, you know, because we couldn't have had a big four and a half, five hour movie, you know. Um, so I think the split was sensible. 
Um, we had some really, really good uh, classic moments in the books on screen, you know, the end, obviously, and scenes with, like, Mrs. Weasley versus Bellatrix, great stuff there. Um, you know, the Battle of Hogwarts was amazing. Um, there are scenes I wish had have made the cut that didn't. Um, I wish, you know, we'd have heard more about Remus and Tonks's son Teddy but you know it didn't happen I understand why but it was in the deleted scenes which angered me I was like couldn't you just have that tiny scene in there um but you know for you know it's only the hardcore fans of Harry Potter of the books I think that are really gonna have faults with it because at the end of the day it did really wrap up the franchise well it was a good ending it was done perfectly it ended with um with Hedwig's theme um Ah, oh, it was just so emotional and you know um it, it was a fitting ending you know i grew up with the books and the movies you know i've kind of aged with harry and so it was really just phenomenal to to see this last chapter up on the big screen the 3d again it was converted it wasn't great but it had some good coming out of the screen moments occasionally uh, a couple of 3d death scenes <laughs> uh, so it kind of did okay in 3D. If it had been shot in 3D, it would have been better. But 3D necessary? No. But uh, the visual effects were amazing. They, you know, stepped up the game so much over the years, the Harry Potter series, and the effects in this were amazing. The Battle of Hogwarts, amazing. The Dragon in Gringotts Vault, amazing. It was just great, great stuff. And uh, a lot of characters got to have their moment, you know. Uh, Snape definitely had his moments. Harry and Voldemort, uh, Ron and Hermione with the kiss at last, uh, McGonagall versus uh, Snape, you know, um, and um, Neville as well, yeah, Neville, definitely another standout uh, character in Deathly Hallows Part 2, love the stuff they did with him, getting him together with Luna uh, in the end of the film, it's like, oh, get over it, fans, it, in the film universe it makes sense, uh, so yeah, a real fitting tribute uh I think, you know, a lot of people sometimes tend to criticise, you know, um, David Yates and David Heyman and Steve Cloves for uh, some of the movies. But, you know, I think they've done a real good job. And as a fan, I think they've done the series proud, J.K. Rowling proud and the fans proud. Uh, so I'm very happy to say that Harry Potter and the Death of Hallows Part 2 uh, makes a number five on the list. Uh, so moving on to number four now. Number four is a horror movie which really, really managed to creep me out. Um, it was a real good year for horror, as I said, 2011. And this movie uh, was a return from uh, James Wan and Lee Winnell. It is, of course, Insidious. Um, wow. <laughs> uh, and produced by Oren Pelly um, from Paranormal Activity. So, you know, we had the... Uh, the creators of Saw making the movie and it was produced by the creator of Paranormal Activity. If this was a horror film that was destined to do well regardless, you know, this is it, you know, if ever there was one, this is it. Um, but although it was destined to do well regardless, it did well, I think, because it was a genuinely good horror film. Um, you know, the it utilised everything. It started off kind of Paranormal Activity-esque, um, but then we got to see the insidious demons and ghosts and dealt with things like astral travelling. And it was a genuinely very creepy and a lot of jumpy moments. And whilst I'm a big fan of the Paranormal Activity franchise, after a couple of viewings with Paranormal Activity, I sometimes think, oh, that's coming up now, that's coming up now. Insidious, I can still think, that's coming up now, yet it still manages to scare me. The man, the, the ghost I've stood behind the baby's crib, uh, you know, with the curtains just blowing gently in front of him. That creeps me out and makes me jump every time. I know it's coming and it still makes me jump. Uh, James Wan, as a director, he really knows how to get the most from his cast. The casting was all great. Uh, no complaints there. And Lee Winnell uh, in another of his own movies again. Great stuff. Um, uh, but he also knows how to work the camera, James Wan, and make shots really... Oh, yeah, he he's just... 
he brings the horror to life. It's great. Um, the demon, yeah, it looked like Darth Maul, but you know what? It's still scary. Um, had a lot of big jump moments and a, a phenomenal ending. Uh, these guys kind of are the master of twists and uh, Insidious didn't let us down on that front. Um, real creepy movie. I, I enjoyed it uh, a lot and I've watched it several times and it's, as I said it still manages to scare me. Um, so I'm thrilled that it made the list. Um, and I can't wait for whatever James and Lee have planned next. Uh, you know, they've done Saw, they've done Dead Silence and they've done Insidious and they're all worth checking out. Um, so hopefully their next project is going to be great. Okay, so we're approaching the top three now. So what movie has taken the number three spot? Well, in at three, I can reveal that it is a threequel, a third installment of a franchise and another horror. Uh, I mentioned Oren Pelly, he started this franchise and now Catfish directors Henry Juice and Ariel Shulman um, came on board for part three. I am talking of course about Paranormal Activity. Yes, Paranormal Activity 3 takes the number three spot. Wow, 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 wow. Oh my gosh, uh, if it, you know, this was definitely the horror film of 2011 for me and it, you know, deciding between Insidious and Paranormal Activity 3 was hard. Insidious was a real scary movie and it still manages to make me jump, but I was terrified of the end of Paranormal Activity 3, genuinely per petrified and I had trouble sleeping the, for a night, you know, when I came home from the cinema the first time I saw it. I, because the ending was just like, oh, what? Let's just say I never, you know, I looked at old ladies in a different way after that, uh, without saying too much. The end really, really creeped me out. And why I loved Paranormal Activity 3 is because it just got everything right. And, you know, I thought, wow, Paranormal Activity 2 was really scary. But looking back now at Paranormal Activity 2, it's nothing in comparison to Paranormal Activity 3. Why I love this movie is it wasn't, you know, it didn't take time to build up um, like the first two. We had big scares from the go all the way through the movie. It was a very fast paced movie. It scares all the way through starting big and not afraid to continue going like that. And it kind of slow down the pace at the end which worked and helped make the end oh so creepy <laughs> so creepy um uh the film also gave us a lot of backstory and mythology for the franchise answered some questions raised some new ones um which is great and and obviously it went back in time in the 80s and we got to learn more about katie and christy and their family um but more so uh we got to care for uh the characters a lot more you know obviously as the girls are children so we obviously care a lot about them and um but also you know uh the girl's mom and her partner dennis you know are both likable and dennis is the first kind of male character in the franchise that isn't a jackass for uh lack of a better word you know he um takes his stuff very seriously and it's him persuading the mum uh, and you know all the characters were very likeable and um, it had some really big scares all the way through and a very creepy ending and had a couple of jokey scares which some people had uh, criticisms with but hey they did their job they made people jump and what I also love about Paranormal Activity 3 is the fact that because the main characters are children you think they're not going to go there they wouldn't do that would they but yes they will they go you know further than what a lot of people probably expected and they're willing to push the boundaries and um yeah it was done very well and as directors you know i loved catfish um real good documentary i thoroughly recommend uh you checking that out a lot of debate of course whether or not it's real they still maintain it's real um i have some inclinations to believe it is and some to believe it isn't i'm still undecided but worth checking out and um, but i 
can see why um, they got brought on to do Paranormal Activity 3 completely. Um, but they also kind of brought their own ingenuity to it. Kind of, you know, they invented the fan cam. Having a camera built on a fan to pan back and forth across a room. That's ingenuity. It's best in a horror film. It's something new, invigorating and exciting. And it really helped breathe some life into this franchise and now uh, they're going to be returning for Paranormal Activity 4 this October which you know is set to deliver some more answers go further into the mythology and you know I just can't wait to see what uh, new and exciting things and what scares these guys have to offer they did an amazing amazing job uh, so big thumbs up to those two okay so it's the top two uh, Last time in 2010, I told you the top two before revealing the winner. Uh, so I will reveal that uh, the top two are X Men First Class and Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Two phenomenal, phenomenal movies which I enjoyed thoroughly. And I'm not going to actually say that it was hard to choose between them because they were both excellent excellent format movies i loved them both but one of them more so stuck out and when i watched it i just thought oh my god that is the film of the year as soon as i saw it in the cinema i was just like that's the film of the year uh so uh which of those is the film of the year well you can probably work it out when i tell you who is number two at two it's X-Men First Class. Ah, um, I am a huge X-Men fan. Love the comic books, love the movies. Anything X-Men, I'm into. Um, so when they announced they were doing a new X-Men movie, it's exciting. Yeah, exciting. And then, oh, Matthew Vaughn's doing it. Okay, he dropped out of X3, but, you know, he, since then, made Kick-Ass, which was a pretty kick-ass movie it was really really good so yeah i have faith in him doing a superhero movie that just happens to be x-men again yeah i think he'll do a good job then we get told the x-men in it havoc banshee darwin angel salvador azrael okay but my god matthew vaughn and screenwriter jane goldman who is the wife of jonathan ross they did a real fantastic job. They made this team work. Obviously, they couldn't use the original team because of the continuity of the original movies. Now, obviously, some of the continuity was broken from uh, the movies anyway. But a lot of it was still intact. And they made this new team work. And the casting was great. Jennifer Lawrence is a young mystique. And then, you know, they had... Um, James McAvoy as Professor X, who we saw in a different light. He wasn't this uh, wheelchair-bound mentor. He was out there fighting the battle with the team, with a full set of hair, running around. And, you know, he was having a good flirt with the ladies as well. Um, and, of course, um, Michael Fassbender, the star of the film, as Magneto. Um, you know, showing us Magneto's origins and his struggle. And the film really was about his friendship with um, Xavier. And then leading up to ultimately their separation and disagreement. And, you know, it featured the rise of the X-Men. Uh, and they made the X-Men great. You know, the characters were really cool. Banshee, really funny. Uh, Nicholas Hult, as a young beast, did a phenomenal job uh, following in the footsteps of Kelsey Grammer. Uh, as I said, um, Jennifer Lawrence's Mystique, brilliant. Um, and, you know, those two leads, uh, James McAvoy and Michael Fassbender, they had the best chemistry you know like Patrick Stewart and McKellen had that chemistry and they had it too which thank god was brilliant um but Fassbender also had a good chemistry with the villain Sebastian Shaw leader of the Hellfire Club played by Kevin Bacon and uh Kevin Bacon as Sebastian Shaw genius genius stuff uh sublime casting as was uh january jones as emma frost got the character spot on uh my only criticism of the movie I, that was that i felt that emma was slightly underused but that is uh, saved by the ending obviously they're going to continue this first class universe with the prequels 
Um, so, you know, that criticism is really a minor one. Um, and, you know, it looked good. The story was coherent. It was, a, you know, it was a period piece set in the 60s, but it still felt like a modern superhero film. But just set in the 60s, it was good. Um, and, you know, the as I said, the cast was great. The direction from Matthew Vaughan was great. And the script by Jane Goldman, great. Um, you know, the costume design was good. You know, Emma's costumes were spot on. Um, but, you know, from, you know, Magneto's and Sebastian Shaw's suits to the Magneto helmet and at the end Magneto in the proper comic book costume and then the X-Men in the blue and yellow, it was it was a welcome change it from, you know, all the leather uh, in the X-Men movies. But it felt like even though it wasn't entirely faithful to the comics, it, def it definitely had that nod to the comics and to the fans, which is why I think the fans really took it on board. And I know I've used this phrase a lot in this uh, countdown but again breathing life into a franchise that's what a lot of these films on the list managed to do and you know x-men first class certainly did that i think better than you know any film you know because i personally like x3 but i know there's a lot of people who don't um so i'm glad that people regain the faith um in x-men through this movie and of course it had two great cameos uh, I'm not going to say who they are in case you haven't seen the movie, but uh, you'll know as soon as you see both of them, or at least one of them you will 100% know. The other one you may or may not know, but you will if you get what I, if you get what I mean. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, anything else I want to say about X Men? Just that it was a fun, uh, fun movie. Um, I enjoyed it, um, and it went real fast as well. And just all around great job, and I can't wait for it to have a sequel. Um, but without further ado, let's move on to the film of the year in 2011. For me, it was, of course, our number one movie, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Now, I'd seen the original movie uh, a long time ago, um, and so when I heard, you know, oh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes is coming out, they're doing a prequel to the Planet of the Apes, I was pleasantly surprised. And I kind of didn't know what to expect. Obviously, I knew kind of what to expect because of the ending of Planet of the Apes. But I was like, hmm, really interesting where the uh, where they're going to go with this. Um, and it just worked uh, so, so well. Um, it's a real uh, heart-wrenching movie. Uh First, the cast, you know, we have Andy Serkis as Caesar, you know, this is, this guy's the king of motion capture, you know, doing Gollum and King Kong, and now Caesar, you know, he gets it on, uh, uh, you know, uh, he gets it spot on, and you know, it's not just CGI, you know, you can see, especially if you see the making lots of the movie, all the emotion put into the performance by Andy is transferred through into Caesar, the finished product, uh, which is great. Andy was great. James Franco, fair play to him. He had, he's had a good uh, couple of years, you know, off the back of Spider-Man, he had 127 hours, which, you know, he was praised for. And then this movie, which, again, he was real good. You like his character. Um, and, he, you know, he's got his struggles going on with his life, he, he's trying to progress in his field of science, uh, curing Alzheimer's, which is motivated by his own father's Alzheimer's. It's got a very personal, heartwarming story to it. And, you know, the story evolves from him saving the child of a monkey he's experimented on and raising, raising him as his own. So it is like that father-child relationship. And so... You know, when Caesar begins to turn and, you know, he's um, put away and then leads the revolt for the apes. It's really, really heart-wrenching stuff and it, it, it is sad. And it, it is a sad movie, in my opinion. I find it really sad. I, you know, the visual effects are amazing. The directing was amazing. All the casting was spot on. Um and the final secret, you know, the final battle of the humans versus the apes, it's just, it was really sad because it's like, 
you feel sad um, for James Franco's character because obviously he's seen everything unfold and it's because of his experiments this has happened and then you're seeing his relationship with Caesar deteriorate um, and then you feel bad on the humans you know because the monkeys are terrorizing them but then you feel sorry for the monkeys the apes because they've been terrorized by the humans and they don't really know any better and no matter who wins everybody kind of loses and it's just a real sad movie and really, I found it really emotional both the story of Caesar and his rise and fall and you know James Franco's character's father um, I think John Lithgow was it John Lithgow um, played him um, I always get mixed up between John Lithgow and Nigel Lithgow but I think it's John Lithgow um, you know with the Alzheimer storyline, it's real. It's a real sad movie, but it was done well. And you know, there's a lot of references to both the original Planet of the Apes and some of its sequels in there, which I really appreciated. Um, Harry Potter star Tom Felton, with a bit of a dodgy American accent, getting Charlton Heston's most famous lines. You know, get get your damn dirt, uh, get your hands off me, you damn dirty ape. Mm, I wasn't sure about him getting that line, but, you know, at least the line was in there as a homage, and, you know, there's other things, you know, like um, the exploration to Mars being mentioned, and then the plane, uh, the shuttle going missing. So it, it was nice that it had that nod to the series. And what surprised me the most uh, was that the movie didn't directly lead in to Planet of the Apes, you know, nor did it end with the world being completely dis uh, taken over. I, whether they're going to continue it, I'm not sure, but it certainly sets up the possibility of a sequel, uh, which I really hope does happen. Um, but as a self-contained story, it, it it had a real strong narrative, uh, and it's just phenomenal. The uh, the action scenes were amazing. You know the CGI is really really well done the motion capture is well done as i said a uh, real great casting um strong story and you know you just feel so emotionally attached in and emotionally invested in the movie you know right from the opening when the monkeys are being hunted in the jungle it's pulling at your heartstrings and it continues to do so right until the end and the film really moved me it had a real profound effect on me and it did it just real really moved me and when it finished i just kind of took it all in for a few moments before you know walking out of the cinema and i think any film that can do that is uh well worth the praise and so that's why in my mind it had to be uh my film of the year for 2011 um and what a good year 2011 was in film um as i said uh paul another notable movie uh that was good uh so i'd like to mention that um, Rango was um, cool, Rio was alright, uh, for me Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, some of you may have expected that to be on the list, I felt that was highly uh, overrated, um, I think the acting in it was great, um, but the pacing was terrible, I understand it's meant to be a slow movie but it was paced terribly, um, and I also felt that with Tinker Tailor, um, you know, there's meant to be four suspects, um, but for me it felt like only two of them really got the screen time um, of, you know, oh, it could be one of these two, and um, one of them was blatantly being pushed as in, oh, that's, it's him, it's got to be him, so I thought, oh, it's going to be this character, and it turned out it was that character, so obviously it couldn't have been longer or slower paced than it was, but I felt there were some scenes in it that could have been uh, chop down to make room for you know more exploration of the other suspects but hey uh, so that's why Tinker Taylor didn't make the list I also saw Troll Hunter in 2011 oh boy uh, I didn't like it at all I, I it marketed itself as a horror now I saw the film Monsters which um a couple of years back um I think it was 2010 which marketed itself as a kind of a sci-fi thing but it was a, a love movie but I really enjoyed it 
Um, but with Troll Hunter, it was marketed as a horror. And I think, was it supposed to be a comedy? I really couldn't tell if it was taking itself seriously, whether it's meant to be taken seriously or whether it was meant to be taken as a comedy or as a horror or as, or as some sort of campy, comical horror. Oh, um, and, you know, it, it got very repetitive and, uh, yeah, it, it just didn't work for me, Troll Hunter. So that was one of my film um, no-goes of... Uh, in terms of recommendation of 2011's movies but um, all in all it wasn't a bad year at all uh, for movies um, but I can't wait uh, for January 2013 that's if the world doesn't end which I don't think it will but because uh, this year is offering us some great movies you know um, we've got Avengers we've got The Dark Knight Rises we've got Hobbit we've got Chronicle uh, we've got Paranormal Activity Fall. Um, oh gosh, there's so many movies coming out this year. Uh, Spider Man, The Wreck Three. I can't wait for that. You know, so much coming out this year. Uh, so how I'm going to do the top ten list of 2012 is beyond me. So it's going to be a tough one. It is going to be a tough one. Um, but thank you for sticking with me. Um, uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, this countdown of my top 10 films of 2011. If you did, be sure to subscribe. Um, by subscribing, you'll also be kept up to date with the latest movie news and reviews. And also, for all kinds of entertainment news, movie, TV, music, um, be sure to um, follow our Tumblr, if you've got Tumblr. That's www.entertainmentzone.tumblr.com. Check it out if you've got Tumblr followers because it's updated a lot more regularly than the YouTube and we have all sorts going on there that you can find information out um, about all the latest going ons um, so yeah uh, be sure to check it out and um, thanks to everyone who stuck by me and uh, uh, with Entertainment Zone it means a lot to me um, this is getting a long video so I'm going to be off now take care guys and I will speak to you soon take care